Okie dokie. So you should all now have a nice view of my slides. Um, so yeah, so as I said, I'm the engagement officer for Dynamic Genescapes. Um, as Richard just mentioned then, Chloe and Sarah, I don't know if you've met David at all, but I've taken over the role from the previous engagement officer, David Kilner. Um, so yeah, so this year we're kind of in the last year of the project and the project's going to end March 2023, but we're looking at getting lots of training in to hopefully give people the tools to contribute and help with, with monitoring at the sites because work will still continue going either after our project finishes and within that as well, just give people the opportunity to learn a little bit more about sand dunes, which is why when I advertise this, I said, come if you're interested in volunteering, but also come if you just want to learn more about dunes. At any time, if I'm going too fast, shout. <laughs> okay, so Dynamic Dunescapes itself is a partnership project. The Work in Wales is funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund, and it has partners both in England and Wales, as we're across England and Wales, and there's 34 sites in total. I work at Plant Life, um, so I'm hosted by Plant Life, but I work on specifically the Dune Skates project. And in Wales, we also work with the National Trust, uh, NRW, the Wildlife Trust, and a suite of other um, colleagues and collaborators throughout the region. So while we're doing citizen science training today, we do have a suite of other training as well um, and other events going on. So anything from bees to butterflies, reptiles, you name it, we're, we're getting some guided walks or training in place if you're interested for the future. So these are our project sites across the whole of England and Wales. Uh, we don't currently work in Scotland or Northern Ireland. And as you can see, there's 12 sites in Wales and I'll go into where they are in a little bit more detail in a moment. So what we're trying to do is restore nine key dune areas across these sites and what that looks like is the 34 dune sites, so a lot of them are part of a larger dune system and I'll speak about what that means in a moment and this covers up to 7,000 hectares. So in North Wales we're based on Anglesey and also down towards Porth Madoch uh, in Morvabucham. So here on Anglesey, the first dot you can see is Cumran, and so that's near the Inland Sea. And then moving across, so these are all near RAF Valley or Ross Niagara, if you're familiar with the area. We've got Tuen Truan, which is actually mainly doesn't look like a dune because it's back on the fixed dune area. And we'll talk about different zones of dunes in a little while. We've got Tuen uh, which if you're a surfer, you also know as Broad Beach, so that area there and the dunes there. So that's also working with the Oyster Catcher, which is the restaurant on that area. And Tuen Ferrum which is the other dune a little bit further down, but that's all the same dune system and all connected or a little less connected. <clears throat> and then, yeah, that's our one site at Morva Bucha. So that's a reserve that's run and owned by the, the North Wales Wildlife Trust. Um, and we work very closely with their volunteer group. So any interest in volunteering, what we usually do is sign you up with a local partner. So you get a whole suite of opportunities through them as well. Um, so it all depends what you're interested in, and the citizen sciences I'll go into tends to be led by the local partners, but I'll be coming and do the field training days, which we'll talk about at the end. So down in South Wales is our other seven sites. So the one you can see there on the map is Pembrey, um, and that is the dunes that are owned by the Natural Resources Wales, but also that are part of the local nature reserve. So we're working with another project called the Sands of Life that are working in the same area. We're in Brefton, um, though at the moment there isn't going to be much work going on there. We're in Oxwich, which is a little further round, and there is a little bit of work going on there. Penmine and Penard, which is on Three Cliffs Bay. And then coming around to Swansea, which is probably the areas that interest all three of you the most. So we've got Crumlin Burrows, which is by the Swansea Bay campus. Baglan Burrows, which is in the more industrial area of Baglan, um, and it's a fair walk, but it's worth it. It's absolutely beautiful. And then finally, Kenvig. So we work with the Plant Life Green Links Partnership and also the Kenvig Warden at Kenvig. And there will be a training day coming up there much later in the year. And as we just mentioned at the start, that there is also going to be a World Sand Dune Day event happening there. So why sand dunes? And we'll go into what a sand dune is in a little bit, but why sand dunes in the first place? 
So they are listed as the habitat that are most at risk in Europe for biodiversity loss. And this is due to significant loss um, due to development and agriculture over the years, habitats becoming disconnected and fragmented. So those dune sites on Anglesey possibly were all the same dune system at one time, but now they're different and disconnected. And we've had a 60% 60 60 reduction in dune area in Wales since 1900s. What this means is what remains and what the focus of the project is, is a sanctuary for threatened plants and animals. So the top picture you can see there is the sand lizard and the bottom picture is the natastack toads. And there's also a whole range of plants that we only find in gene systems that we're trying to encourage either enhancing the habitat so that we can see more occurrence of these plants, or in some places we have been considering reintroduction, but that is a quite a complex subject, which I know a lot of people are getting into as we focus a little bit more on rewilding and um, reintroductions of species in the current climate of the biodiversity crisis that we're in. So what's the problem? Historically, we've managed sand dunes in a way that is to stabilize sand dunes. And what that means is that it's reduced the natural dynamicness of the dunes. I don't say the word on the screen, dynamism, because I can't say it. <laughs> so historically, we've been managing sand dunes to stabilise them, and this has included plants and marion grass and encouraging the growth of vegetation. Now, we do need all of these factors within a dune, but too much in one direction, and the system can become overstabilised. So what we're seeing now is actually a shift in the conservation and the way we do conservation, which is being done by the Sands of Life Project and Dynamic Dunescapes. And this is to introduce some of that dynamicness back into the dune systems to open up their sand. And we'll talk about why in a second. So what's happening is these sand dune systems are actually being smothered and fixed by rank or tall vegetation and invasive scrubs. So invasive species is another challenge that we're facing. We see a reduction in the amount of bare sand and therefore the amount of movement that can happen in the dunes, which can reduce the growth of dunes. And um, so if you think about any big dunes you've seen where they're quite tall, if that was all fixed by vegetation, that's less likely to happen. And also a reduction in biodiversity of species. So the advice has slightly changed. And now we're looking at conserving dunes for biodiversity and the type of management strategies we're using. But it's all about right dune, right time, right place. So within the project, our management changes from site to site. And you'll see that in terms of monitoring that that changes from site to site. So to give you a little bit of a view of what dune stabilization, stabilization looks like, this is what Kenvig looked like in 1947. You can see lots of open bare sand. And that open bare sand is great for sand dune species. And species and invertebrates that love the open bare sand or reptiles that will sit along the edges, bask and then disappear into the vegetation. The same place in 2013 is now covered and fixed with vegetation, which means the plants have grown and they've stabilised the sediment, which is great in some places. But over stabilisation means that dune is no longer a dynamic system. So I already mentioned that invasive native and alien species. So invasive natives are species that are native to the UK, but not native to our region. And invasive alien are species that come in, usually being reintroduced, possibly through gardening or other, other routes. So some of the species that we're removing include sea buckthorn um, on our sites in South Wales, and also the Japanese rose. And some of the work that's been going on, usually with our student projects, has demonstrated, for example, with the Japanese rose, presence of the rose appears to lead to a reduction in biodiversity of both plants and invertebrates. An increase in scrub, so scrubby species, and what that means is an increase in scrub or an overabundance of scrub, such as gorse, that almost suffocates and outcompetes other smaller plants. So we end up with a less biodiverse dune system. Increases in nitrogen deposition, and this can happen for a suite of reasons. And this can mean that we get nitrogen loving species that grow very quickly and outcompete the natural less nitrogen loving dune species. The stabilization of dunes, another word I can't say <laughs> that I've already mentioned. And that dune habitat as a whole is shrinking. And what that means is we're losing the connectivity between different parts of dune systems and dune habitats. And this can mean that we don't get flow of plants, pollinators, and other 
invertebrate and vertebrates that might use these systems as their home. So we're going to go into this in much more detail as we go through. In terms of our conservation actions, it's all about looking at the site and assessing what needs to be done for each habitat due to the quality of the habitat of the species found there. At the very start of the project, this meant there was a suite of environmental and geomorphological surveys that were undertaken to understand the water table, to understand anything about the species composition. And even as we go through the project, we keep doing these surveys. So these have been used to inform the works that are happening. So everything's gone through gradual planning to decide what's best for what site. Right June, right time, right place. So across the project, this covers everything we kind of just started to touch on. So a creation of bare sand, removal of invasive species, the restoration of dune slacks, which are dune wetlands. So I'll talk about how we do that and what they are as we continue through. Removal of that vegetation and scrub to open up areas and reduce succession, which is when the community gets to the point of growth that has gone through from your pioneer species to the larger species that dominate and going through that process of succession. Introducing of grazing species, so this might be horse, cattle or sheep. And all of these species graze in very different ways. So cattle actually curl their tongue around the vegetation they eat and crop it up. Whereas horses and sheep might graze and clip close to the surface. So these different grazing patterns are helpful for different species. And finally, the creation of notches. So that's actually opening up, and that's our biggest work, a notch. And I'll show you a picture of one in the frontal dunes so that air and sand can blow through into the dunes and introduce bare sand, whereas before it wouldn't be able to reach. So in total, what is our project actually going to be delivering? As I said, it'll be 7,000 7, hectares of habitat restoration and looking for about 35% of total sand dune resource to achieve a favorable condition. This will support 33 important sand dune species. So this can be from reptiles to amphibians, other invertebrates and also plants. And there's a whole suite of resources. So we're really scratching the surface today. This is gonna to be a lot of information, but treat this as an introduction to the citizen science program, how you can get involved in sand dune ecology. This will be recorded, as I've mentioned, and we'll be sharing this round as well as all of our other resources. So there's lots of YouTube videos to go and watch and the handbook itself. We've got the Citizen Science Handbook, which I'll be referring you back to. But there's also training manuals on the website for people that are interested in sand dune management to understand it a little bit more. So that was our whirlwind beginning. How's everyone doing? Do we all need a stretch? And have we got any questions? <laughs> I'm happy to keep going if everybody else is. If you want a break, feel free. <laughs> Sorry, I'll sip my water as we go. Cool. Right. Let's keep cracking. You okay, Sarah? Yeah, I was just going to say I'm good. So what is a sand dune? So starting off, what is a dune? A pile of sand? <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> So there's lots of factors and processes involved to make a coastal sand dune. It needs different elements, and we'll talk about what those are in just a second. But the dune itself is a place between land and sea that many people will pass through on their way to the beach. But it is actually a place that's full of life and full of some really interesting things happening in terms of the way we've got small plants growing, which will then pave the way for bigger plants and pave the way for eventually us to reach the land and the forests and the communities that we see going inland. And in the dune itself, we've got loads of sand movement, we've got some wetlands and lots of plants working in different ways together. So as they go through this cycle, we see different zones and we see different stages between them. We start off by the coast and we move inland. And there's that profile that you might think of when you're thinking of a dune. You've got these really tall dunes at the start and then it starts to flatten out. And we'll talk about what that is in a moment. And this building of the dune and the process from start to finish, as we mentioned, is the process of succession. 
it's succession heading from your pioneer or your first settling species all the way through to a more complex community of plants and species and finally dominating species where we've got trees present and in the gene system a lot of what we're trying to do is manage that system so that we start off with the small community and we keep it diverse where it should be and we keep forests at bay because otherwise these coastal dunes are squeezed between the land and the sea. So in terms of the key ingredients, I do want you to unmute and shout and interrupt each other. What do you think the four key ingredients for dynamic dunes are? Wind. Yes. Sand. <laughs> yes. These two aren't trick, I promise. The sea. Yeah, so water. There's one more. I'll give you a clue. <laughs> I say it's, it's vegetation was going to be my next, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, and no, it, <laughs> it is. That's perfect. So yeah, the four key things are sand, wind, water, and plants. The sand is brought in by the wind. And actually what you get in sand dunes is something called sand rain. We can measure that to see how dynamic a dune system is. And then the water brings the sand. So it can be the sea that's bringing the sand through processes of movement along the beach with sand within the sea. Or the water is also what drives. You can see just here, let me get my pointer. The water table down at the bottom and the level of the water table would influence the plant communities. And this is the dune slack and the dune wetland that I spoke about. And you can see this is very low to the water table. And that's why we end up with a wetland. But in a lot of regions, we are losing the dune slacks due to the level of the water table changing or the height of the dune changing. So some of our work is to bring this height back down so we can reintroduce these dune slacks. And then finally, the plants. The plants are a really important part of succession in the dune system for fixing this habitat in place. So just to go through the different zones of a dune, we start off at the beach and the strand line. So what you'll notice about the citizen science and the monitoring is when we're doing fixed transects, they'll end at the strand line. They'll end as you get onto the beach. So we capture where some new baby dunes, so embryo dunes might be forming. And also so we can have a look at what is in that area. Sorry, I've got hiccups. In terms of the strand line, this is also a very special area for the dunes because you do end up with some interesting species here. So the strand line beetle, for example, is a species of particular interest to our project. And that is associated, as you can imagine, with the strand line. And if you're ever out on a walk, you might find it under debris. Um, and we can go into that a little bit more in other training courses of what the strand line beetle looks like, because this is something we're particularly interested in getting records of. On the strand line as well, you might find, for example, shark eggs or egg cases. These also can blow up into the dunes, and these are indicators of sharks and rays or skates in the local area. And these are other things that we really want to get records of. And if people are interested in courses on that, we're thrilled to run one. So as you're moving through, we're then moving into the mobile dunes, which is a zone itself. So the mobile dunes are a zone, and there's places within the mobile dunes that we're going to talk about. So what you can see there is the embryo dune and the mobile dune. So mobile dunes form at the strand line and they contain a lot of bare sand. So that's that area where you're sat on the beach, your four dunes, the area that you're seeing, that very beginning part of the dunes. And there's also annual plants present. So these are plants which complete their whole life cycle within a year from germination to the production of seeds, growing, dying, and then what they're doing is creating a root system that starts to stabilize that miniature pile of sand that's forming. So you might see miniature dunes in these areas. This is a picture taken at Morbabucha. And you can see here, we're right on the edge of the dune. Let me get my pointer again. Just here with the pioneer plants or the first plants stabilizing and beginning to start the process of dune building. So the embryo dunes are the young dunes, and these are usually above the high tide land and line and also contain a lot of bare sand. So this is where you're seeing the smaller dunes are quite dynamic and you've got the pioneer plants starting to stabilise the sand. 
they're very low and the plants are all around or the sand is around the low dune. These dunes are actually only often present in summer and it's when they become stabilized and persist that they grow into bigger dunes. So they will be washed in and out because of how small they are and the fact they're not as stable as some of the older parts of the dune. So continuing through as we get a bit deeper towards the land now. So we've still got the characteristic that it's heavily made up of bare sand. And this is where you're going to see lots of marron grass dominating. So that's the next species. So you've got the first pioneer and then you've got the marron grass and their root systems will start to stabilize the sand even further. And you'll see how that stabilization can lead to a succession and a more diverse plant community forming as we move inland. So at the moment, the plant community may not be so diverse and you'll see it kind of does this as we go inland. So here you might think, find things like sea holly or sea spurge. So next time you're out on the dunes, take a second and have a look in the marron grass because it won't just be marron, you'll see other little plants. So the sea holly, I've got a picture later, looks like a spiky holly and things like sea spurge um, are just, yeah, beautiful kind of floaty strands of, of leaves. So you, as we're going in again, we're now in the four dunes and that's still part of that mobile dune system. So that's behind the embryo, standing a few metres tall, and we're seeing more and more marron grass stabilising this area of dunes. So what you might see if there's over is a lot of marron grass, which means there's not much movement within this area. But we are seeing more vegetation naturally, even anyway. And this is what we were talking about. If you think about the embryo dune, it's quite small and possibly less stable, but now we've got more plants, the dune is becoming more stable and more resilient to storms. So it can stay in the same position for a number of years. And then we might see differences happening if some of the vegetation is removed, they can form a dune blowout, which is one of these. So this picture, picture, this picture was taken at Tuam Ferrum. So this is a natural process where the dune has become unstable or has become more dynamic and a dune blowout has happened. So the sand has blown with the wind to create this dip. And now what will happen is some of the sand has been freed up. So sand will move inland into the dune and we're creating a dynamic system. And you'll find that smaller plants will start to settle again. So that whole process of succession and settlement of the pioneer species will begin again. It means that areas like this can be quite high in diversity. So yeah. It's the exposure of sand happening usually because of storms or high winds, and it allows dunes to migrate, to shift, to be dynamic. This is blown elsewhere into the system. So the front of the dunes is where we expect to see the most dynamic area of the dune. As we begin to move somewhat inland, we start to find the fixed dunes. So to begin with, is a semi-fixed dune. This is some images that you can see on the screen here. I'm just moving because where you are on my screen. <laughs> so there is less bare sand cover than you would expect in the mobile dune area. And species presence begins to change with diversity increasing. So we're starting to see a bit more of a diverse community of species. And this is what you can see on the right hand side here is this, you can actually even just see it in the colour. You've got more diversity, but we have still got the sand between the grass. So it isn't just soil and it isn't just sand. And you're also starting to see other grasses. So this is red fescue just in the bottom left hand corner, popping up between the patches of marrow and possibly even mosses as well. So as you're getting a more diverse plant community, the genes are becoming more stable. And you can also see that the root systems are, or you can imagine that the root systems of the plants are stabilizing the sediment below the surface. So that soil or sand below the surface, holding it in place and making it an ideal place for other plants to begin growing. And these areas will continue to accrete sand um, from the beach that is blowing in over the bridge. 
So this is part of the reason we might put a notch in is if we're finding that there's no sand coming through in time, this will move from a semi-fixed dune with some bare sand and a diverse habitat to a fixed dune where it's more dominated by larger plants and a less biodiverse assemblage of species. They're also known as yellow dunes. Um, I think this will depend on where you are, but that's because of the colour of the sand, because it is still very sandy compared to where you start to move inland. So that moving inland is the fixed dunes. So now we're starting to really see a vegetated community. So lots of plants, less sandy colour and the sediments and all the soil is a bit of a different colour. So cover of bare sand is like less than 10%, so quite reduced and soil is beginning to form. So this is hummus as in soil hummus, not as in let's go have a nice snack with a carrot. So soil is beginning to form and different plants can now coexist because there's different characteristics of the ground that allow these plants to exist and get different nutrients that they need. They're no longer the yellow dunes because the color of the dunes is changing. It's becoming less sandy, more gray, more brown um, because of that hummus form forming as you have a plant it dies it rots down and forms a nutrient layer and this might be where we start to see some exciting lichens or even more mosses present and there is little if any scrub or tree cover so this is an area where you're still expecting to see smaller plants nothing big like a scrub bush and nothing like a tree but they're becoming a lot better at holding water, which again can change the community of plants. So that's why we might end up with a dune wetland. So these are dune slacks. Um, I mentioned them earlier. Dune slacks are freshwater. And how a dune slack is formed is when the surface layer of the dune, so the level or height of the dune, is close enough to the water table that when the water table rises, it creates a seasonal wetland as it permeates through the ground. So they're in those depressions between different dune ridges. And they can be very large and can be wet and contain freshwater pools, or they can just be very marshy. And they're fantastic for specialist plants and wildlife. So these areas, for example, are used by amphibians for breeding and for laying of eggs. Um, and certain plants will be found there as well. So some reeds. But something that's more like a reed marsh that is always wet is a slightly different habitat. And we have one of those at Crumlin Burrows and also at Baglin Burrows and other sites as well. <laughs> so, yeah, the pools don't remain all year round. So that's a key characteristic of these wetlands. And finally, we're now getting right to the edge. So we're on the boundary where dune is becoming woodland and woodland is becoming land. So it's that real moment between sea and land that is just this boundary that follows our coastline. So as you can see here, there's a few different examples of what you might see when you reach the woodland. And in this habitat, there's a dominance of tall, woody species um, and a community of understory species as well. But diversity is a lot lower because there might be a domination of the biggest species and also there's very little bare sand here so we're thinking now that we are pretty much in a woodland but it might be a wet woodland where there is still marshy areas and there is dry areas so it can still be a really interesting community with different zones within it another habitat that we have some great examples of here in wales is actually dune heath and I should say, after this, I'm going to send around the slides and at the bottom, you will see there are links to YouTube videos. So there's a whole range of resources on our YouTube site to just follow up with some of the stuff I'm talking about now. So Dune Heath itself is a heather heath and its soil is dry and acidic, so it's decalcified and nutrient poor. And this is particularly important that it is decalcified and acidic for these heaths to form. These plants are associated with acid grasslands and heaths and it may include, like I said, heather and sometimes you may get lichen mixed in with that as well. So this is actually the lichen heath that's at Cumran on Anglesey and around August, September time you'll see this come into colour and it'll be this bright, beautiful array of colour um, coming into the end of the summer. 
So yeah, June's a great places to visit all year round to see them at different times of the year, the different colors. So at the moment they're in bloom. And then in the June time, it will not be so bright and colorful. Then we'll get some more color at the end of the year. And then we're starting to get into fungi season. But there are some fungis out there already. These are very rare habitats. So some of our sites have got some really important examples of this. So Penn Mine, for example, which is also a National Trust site. So there's lots of history there. Um, but there is a June Heath at Penn Mine. So I highly recommend going for a walk on three cliffs to have a look at the beautiful June Heath. So that's a setting of what Junes are. Has anyone got any questions? And I'm just gonna double check that I haven't heard from anyone while you're having a think. So. As I mentioned, the management within dynamic dunescapes is slightly different to how dunes have been managed historically. So historically, it's been about stabilization and encouraging people not to go into the dunes. Now, in some places that management advice may continue, but there's also an understanding, as we said, through doing research and being science led as a project, that dunes do need to be dynamic to also thrive. So there's a whole range of different management strategies that we're using at our different dune sites. So this is from management of scrub and removal of vegetation to scrapes. So you can actually see what they are in a second and I'll explain through each of these because they're a bit of an alien word once we first get started. Notches, which I've mentioned already, introduction of grazers, encouraging disturbance and also mowing or cutting, which is again that management of vegetation. So what you can see here, this is at Oxwich in South Wales, and this is how it did look. And you can see that it's quite fixed. There is a lot of vegetation, there's a lot of plants. We have got some gene wetlands, but very much you can't really see, you can imagine that this is quite stable. And Oxwich itself was stabilized um, in the 90s, I think it was, with mound grass planting. Down here is the work that we've been doing. So this is one of the biggest types of work that we do when it comes to putting in a notch, which is a nick or a cut in the frontal dunes to open up the dune so that you can go through and wind can bring sand into this area of dune. What this has been paired with, and actually what we're seeing is this is very dynamic because this notch is filling in. So that's one of the things we're monitoring. So at this site, there's fixed point photography. And those pictures will help us monitor how quickly the notch is filling in as sand is being blown into the site. So the site has a real potential for being very dynamic, but because of the stabilization in the past, it's not maybe as dynamic as you would expect. And then what we've done here is a scrape. So basically what this does involve, and I'll go through it a bit more detail in a moment, is for workmen and contractors to come in and they remove the top layer of the vegetation, the sediment, the soil. So as you can see, it was here and bring it back down to bare sand, opening up the bare sand. And in this case, to encourage wetland or some slacks to kind of form. But this area isn't as wet as we expected. So we've got a lot of open sand, which is really important for different species and re-encouraging biodiversity. So it's used on sites that are overstabilized. For example, the National Nature Reserve. And it's cut into the four dunes using large machinery. Now, this only happens at very, very particular times of year to minimize disturbance. This is completely out of bird nesting season, usually over winter. And it allows an increase in wind speeds through the site and sand supply to site areas that wouldn't have had it previously. And bare sand, as we covered, is needed for genes to remain dynamic and for biodiversity to thrive. So you can see there's a big difference from picture one to picture two of how much bare sand was open and actually what the community of vegetation might look like. What we can also talk about in terms of a scrape is turf stripping. So it's a similar thing where you're just taking off the top layer of turf. So you can see this has been done in Cumbria, that they're just removing the top layer. When it's first done, um, it can seem quite dramatic, but over time it, it becomes part of the landscape and is used as a way to manage succession and to also encourage higher levels of diversity. And these two examples are from Anglesey. So the top one is Toen Ferram and the bottom one is Toen Finn. So it's used to increase the dynamics and reduce the established vegetation cover. So it encourages 
new species to settle and also opens it up for vertebrates and invertebrates to come in and use the area. So literally going along and just scraping away the top layer of vegetation and soil, so taking away the nutrients as well. What this can also mean is by scraping away that top layer that actually it becomes open for the seed bank. So when you have the ground, just below the ground is the seed bank. And this is the bank of seeds of everything that's kind of been there over the years. But what you might find is that that seed bank can't proliferate because of the domination of other species. So in areas where we've done turf stripping, sometimes it's been with the goal of opening it up and seeing if we can get species such as some rare orchids to return to the site. So yeah, the turf stripping is similar to the scrape, same as the actual notch, is that we have large machinery come in. But what actually happens is at the end, the soil or sediment from the large machinery is bundled up on the sides. And this can be for actually encouraging a different type of community to form. And also rabbits tend to love it. So rabbits as well are something else I'll chat about as little sand dune managers and how we're managing for them. And overall, we look to see an increase in biodiversity and restore these wetlands. So I'm just gonna, it might not play. I'm just gonna try and play it if it will. So what you're seeing there is vegetation and scrub clearance. So this is again at Morva Buchan. That's actually one of the volunteers that works there who got his license through um, the Wildlife Trust. And we actually do have some funds for volunteers working on sites to look towards getting these kind of licenses. So what's happening there is that he's cutting back the scrub. And the reason for that is they have cattle on this site. And if we cut back the scrub, it opens it up and allows cattle to come through who will graze and create a difference in the plant community. So they're a different way of us managing it because as they graze, they're taking out the larger plants and opening up areas for smaller plants to grow. We also don't want to see the area completely dominated by scrub because that will again outcompete some species, but we do leave some scrub because it can be very, very good for reptiles, for example, um, or also some rabbits will use it as a warren rather than burrowing underground. And we see this at some sites in Anglesey as well. There you go. It might not just be using equipment such as the bushwhacker. It might also be people coming in and actually cutting down by hand trees, and bushes just to then rake it away and take it off site. In some cases, depending on what we're removing, it may also be buried on site. It all depends on the species. And with some invasive species, you have to be quite careful so that we don't cause them to spread further. Mowing and cutting is very similar. And it's again with the aim of taking down the height of the vegetation to increase the likelihood of a more biodiverse plant community. And you can see on the left that we've got one of our larger mowers and these can be huge. They can be robo mowers or they can be driven mowers as well. So a robo mower is a robot mower um, and that can go through bigger, bigger bushes and also small grassy areas. Sometimes what you might find is somewhere that looks mown hasn't and that's just the work of grazers and it's quite amazing. So again, our ponies, our sheep and also rabbits. So rabbit populations on dunes are a really important part of dune systems because they graze and they keep the vegetation quite low. And also their digging activities open up their sand. But in some dune systems, we found quite a high reduction in the number of rabbits and the rabbit populations, because if the dune has become overly rank, so that long grass and dominating plant community, the rabbits won't go in there. So they need shorter grass and then they will come in and make it even shorter. And also historically, we've lost rabbit populations due to disease and around after kind of the war, they became less popular. So we used to actually rear rabbits in dunes, which is why a lot of the dunes are called warrens. But historically, we shifted away from that after the war. So it was less popular to rear the rabbits and rabbit populations started to decrease. And pair that with disease, you saw an even greater decrease in rabbit populations. 
So you can see another example here of just that before and after. And the scrub is being removed um, to, well, it's a natural process. So scrub is a natural process of succession, but and scrub itself is often rich habitat for wildlife, but too much, as we've mentioned, so it's all about a balance, can be problematic. It means we lack habitat for specialist species. The scrub itself can be nutrient loving or create an increase in nutrient as it rots down, which means that specialist dune species that are nutrient sensitive may not be found on the site any longer. And it reduces movement and wind because it's so dominating and so large, you'll get less wind moving through the area. So other reasons we might remove scrub will be to open up bird corridors. Um, so yeah, it really changes by site. Another thing that I have touched on is native invasive non-native species or invasive native species. So species that are being introduced to the site that we are working to remove. And the two prime examples that I used earlier were sea buckthorn and Japanese rose. So Japanese rose um, is a species, it's a very popular gardening species and it grows very quickly and is shown to outcompete plants and also create a reduction in the number of invertebrates that we see in compared to when there is no Japanese rose. Sea buckthorn, on the other hand, also outcompetes because it grows so virulently and so large across given areas. So Pembrae, we've been doing work to remove sea buckthorn. So these species can dominate and they can also cause wetlands to dry out. And this is what it looks like when you have the rabbits. So going back to the grazing now, this is what it looks like when there is a large rabbit population keeping the grass short. So what you can see here, get my pointer again, all of this here, all of this here hasn't been mown. That's rabbit activity, all this area. So it's quite amazing when you see it, if there is large healthy rabbit population numbers, but again, it's a balance as with anything when it comes to conservation, it's a balance between too many and too little. So depending on a site might depend on what type of grazers we decide to bring in or use. On the dynamic dunescape sites, some of our sites have got grazers. So for example, in Morvabuchan, which is a wildlife reserve, we have cows in the winter and ponies in the summer. And in Oxwich, you might also find there's ponies down there at given times of year, and likewise on three cliffs. So they're used on sites that are vegetation rich because of the way they graze and those different ways I mentioned will help us to manage how much vegetation there is and the levels of vegetation or the heights of vegetation to try and introduce or encourage a more biodiverse plant community. It's in particularly important to have grazers when there are no natural grazers present, so that's the rabbits. What grazers are actually also great at doing um, maybe that if we find that rabbit populations are quite low, we'll introduce grazers to open up areas which rabbits will move into. Because when it comes to managing for rabbits, like I said, they won't go into the area otherwise. So grazers are one way for us to encourage that. They encourage, they encourage, they help to control the height of plants, reducing scrub growth, they eat in different ways, and they can increase biodiversity of plants and wildlife. So you're getting a sense that in terms of managing the dunes in a different way and creating this dynamic landscape or supporting and enhancing this dynamic landscape, it's a balance between somewhere in the middle. And disturbance is similar, that when it comes to disturbance, this might come from the activity of cows, for example, trudging through a marshland, and that can actually open up habitat for some very, very rare species that we have in the UK. And it can be good or it can be bad. So it all depends on where it's happening, how often and to what scale. And again, right place, right time. So disturbance, like we said, it can maintain areas of bare sand or maintain areas of muddy wetland, allow the germination of seeds and allow certain species that may not be present to come back through. So for example, that might be that the disturbance can lead to us having the right setting for a very small rush that we find in North Wales. So going back, and I'll keep saying this, there's lots of additional learning, lots of additional resources. And I'll send you all of these links to just have a look through, have a watch of the videos in your own time. 
this is very much an introduction today and when we do do the field days there'll be a much more in-depth kind of site tour and an idea of what there is at each site in terms of work in terms of looking at some key features of the site as well as doing the training for the specific monitoring at those sites so again i'm going to stop there just for a few minutes does anyone have any questions take a comfort break how are you all doing Are you planning on on a break now? If people would like a break, we can take a five minute one. We've got plenty of time. Yeah, quite fancy a cuppa if you don't mind. Cool. Right, <laughs> let's do that. We need okay. to break our brains. Please pause, step away from your screen. We'll come back and start that on 11, okay?
Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, right. Is everyone back? Can everyone just give me a shout or a thumbs up? Cool. Thanks, Sarah. I see. You. And Richard. Cool. We'll just give a few minutes for Chloe to make your way back. Um, yeah, sorry, I should say I can't see the chat while I was presenting. So I've just seen that you did ask a question. I'm imagining uh, you were talking, Richard, when we were at almost the woodland and when we're getting to a dominated community. So yeah, that would be the climax community. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what I was asking. Brilliant. Thank you. And um, thanks, Chloe, for confirming. Yeah, there was probably a moment where I went to say that and the words slipped my mind. <laughs> so thank you for reminding me. Great. Right. Let's get cracking. Um, yeah, if you do have questions, do pop them in the chat. So what I'm gonna do is just reconfigure my screen a little bit. Hopefully, yeah, there we go. They stay. So I should be able to see them coming up now. But like I said, unmute, interrupt, very informal. Um, is the pace okay for everyone? You know, is there anything you'd like me to explain a little bit further while we're going through? Cheers, Chloe. Cracking. We'll carry on then. So this bit is going to be more focused on the citizen science monitoring. So, so far, we've just set the scene of what the different habitats are, what the project is, and what kind of work that we're doing. So in terms of citizen science, how many of you have actually done a citizen science project before? Either, again, unmute or just shove a thumbs up in the chat if you have. We'll just say no if you haven't. No one. Yeah, I love that, Sarah. There is something very particular about finding species and just figuring out what they are. Nothing formally. And Richard's done the app with David at Kenvig a few times. Yeah, no, that all counts. So even the informal recording. So if you're using things like iSeq, um, or I think it's Seek and iNaturalist, they are citizen science apps. So it's still exactly the same thing, your data. So citizen science, Presentation is misbehaving now. Citizen science is defined as scientific work undertaken by members of the public, often in collaboration with the direction of a scientist or scientific institutions. What it is, to take it away from that very dry definition in some ways, is that citizen science is science done by people out and about like ourselves. You have a little bit of training like you're doing now. And then you go and you collect data that's really useful to projects for getting really large data sets. So for example, citizen science projects you might have heard of um, are Cocoast, the big seaweed search, the Great British Beach Clean, the big butterfly count, the big garden bird watch, all of these are citizen science projects. So training could look like sitting today for two hours and talking about a project. Or it might be that you get a handbook and you just go through it and then you sit and you do just the one monitoring exercise. So yeah, any of that all counts as citizen science. And what we need is your help to monitor the dynamism on the health of sand dunes. So it's really useful as a way for us to monitor the health of sand dunes by going in and routinely monitoring for any change at fixed points on our sites. This can help us to monitor the effects of restoration work done so far and to inform future work. So this data is really meaningful to help us to facilitate and to monitor the work we've done and to decide or indicate what might be needing to be done in the future. So I'll send this link around again. So our citizen science project is all based around an app. So just grab my phone. So the app itself is called the Dynamic Dunescapes app, and it's available on the App Store or on Google Play. And it looks just like that picture on the screen. 
we won't grab our phone because the phone's frozen. <laughs> so it looks just like that picture on the screen. And the app will allow you to complete infield data entry into your phone. And then that data gets uploaded directly to a portal that's refreshed every 15 minutes. But the data can also be downloaded back down again if you want to have a look at the data you've collected. And then that data can be accessed by our site managers to create reports and to understand the effects of the monitoring and the conservation work we have done so far. You can also use paper forms. So all of these are on our website. And again, I'll send you these links. So as I go through our monitoring, this is top level introduction to the monitoring. This is why we're pairing this with field days. When I send you the handbook, it'd be great if you can spend some time looking through the YouTube videos, looking through the monitoring methods, just to understand a little bit more in your head of how we do the monitoring. And on our website, you'll find that there are paper forms we can also use. If you don't have a smartphone, you can do it by paper form, but these have to be uploaded via the app by someone. So they need to either be returned to a site manager or the survey leader at the time so that they can go in and enter the data through the app. So how does it work? Download it to your smartphone, super easy, super simple. And that will download the most up-to-date version. Like I said, it's on the App Store. And if there's any updates that happen, or if you, ever find, if you ever have any issues with it, close the app and either reinstall it or just refresh it. You're gonna set up a profile and log into the app. So you have to set up a profile to be able to log your data. And then you're gonna choose your survey site. So once you're in the app, it looks like this. So once you're in the app, this is your home screen. And you can select, you can have a look at the activities you can do. So everything we're talking about today is also in the app. So all of the methods forms, all of the species ID guides that I'll mention, they're all in the app somewhere. So you can have a look at the different activities you can do, and then you can select a survey site. So I'm going to use Kenvig as an example. So we come in the app and we would click Kenvig. And I think it's down as Kenvig Nature Reserve. And then you're going to press the plus button to start your survey. Down here, you can see species and habitats. So these are ID guides. Again, at the different sites, there will be a whole bunch of equipment and guides that are held usually by the site manager or a local volunteer group. It can be borrowed to go and do citizen science monitoring. And in there, there will be some paper or laminated copies of these species and habitat guides as well. So you click through the button to get to species and that has all of our pictures of these species and what they are, that are our indicator species that I'll talk about in a moment. And habitats is a different habitat. So that's what we just spoke about, the different zones, the different habitats within a gene system. You can see your past surveys and you can come home and up here you can see the current um, version of the system that you've got. So yeah, this will give you an overview of all the citizen science type surveys and hit plus to begin your survey. So select site, hit plus. You select once you're there what type of survey you want to do and we'll go through these now and when you're done you just finish and submit your data. And then that comes back to our growing data set and gives a clearer picture of how our work is either supporting management in the future or what's happening in terms of biodiversity. So for example, some of the monitoring that we do, which is vegetation quadrats. Oh, I just spotted your message. Yeah, which is, yeah, so this will be the app you were using with David. Um, so yeah, this is, the, this is the app that will continue and these are being used at site. So even once our project finishes in 2023, it will continue to be used so that monitoring can be done to understand what's happening on the site. And yeah, so this can just help us to understand either the biodiversity or how the site is changing as a result of works done. Any questions about the app? If you do, stick them in the chat. Like I said, I got it open so I can see it now. <laughs> so in terms of our monitoring programs, as I said, this is an intro. 
And if you want to join a field day and do some more monitoring with us, I would encourage you to spend a little time of your own time just going through some of the resources I'll send over to get a little bit more familiar with what opportunities for volunteering and helping us to monitor the sites are available. So different sites have different monitoring in place. So I think I mentioned this right at the start. So some of our sites will have all of these activities and some might only have one. The way to find that out is when you're in the app, if you click on a monitoring activity, it will pop up and tell you whether or not you can do it. So for example, at Oxwich, we only have fixed point photography surveys at the moment. So that means you can go in and you can do a fixed point photography survey, which is our simplest one. You just take a picture and that is really valuable data. So even though it's really simple, it's one of the most valuable data sets because we can see, so like that Kenvig photo earlier, how the genes changing over time. To the kind of contrast at Cromlin Burrows, there is a whole suite of activities going on. So there is Sonation transects, there is quadrats, there is fixed point photography, and there is also dip wells. So varies by site. Each site has equipment related to the monitoring place, and that's usually kept either by a local volunteer group or site manager. So once we kind of go through this training and you come to a field day, what will happen after that is I will connect you with a local group or site manager that is doing training at those sites and running surveys so that you can connect with them or you can sign up and you can also then have access to more opportunities in the future to work with these people. And on the field days, we'll go through that specific site. And for example, we might talk about some varied things. So at the moment, there isn't a field day um, scheduled for Gower, but if our people are interested, it's something we will pair with a guided walk, as I mentioned earlier. So it's just getting that pair between the two. Okay, so zonation. You recognize this one from earlier. So zonation is to help us to understand the boundaries between all of those different habitats or zones that we mentioned right at the start as I was going through what is a sand dune. So what this means is it can enable us to monitor how the zones or transition of areas might be changing. Sorry. So the aim is to record the locations of transitions between habitats. So how we're transitioning from the strand line to the embryo dune, from the embryo dune to the mobile genes, so on and so forth. And we do this by mapping and photographing the boundaries. So as we move through the genes, every time the boundary changes and you use a sand dune guide to help you identify this, you stop, you take a GPS point, pictures in each direction, and you measure how far you've come. And over time, this means we can build up a picture of how these boundaries are changing if they are, and if they're fluctuating, is it that the forest and the woodland is encroaching on the fixed dune? And if it is, do we need to manage that? Is it that actually we're finding that the mobile dunes are growing quite rapidly? And that's great, but we need to monitor that. And what you can see on the right-hand side is an example of in-app, the method that's there. So this is available as a PDF, or in the app itself. So how we do this? Most of these are best done in pairs, and it's a fixed transect, so a straight line through the site from point A to point B. You start off using phone, GPS, to find the start of the transect. And on the app, it will tell you what the compass bearing is to navigate along the transect. So you find the start, get your compass bearing, and you start to head along the transect itself. Using the June guide handbook, so that's the zone handbook, um, sorry, the June guide, which is in the handbook. So that's what I mentioned, that where it said habitats on the app, it'll tell you the different habitats. So embryo, fixed June, uh, mobile June, and kind of woodland fixed getting into heath. So you'll be able to see what the habitats are and what they have as pictured examples, and there'll be hard copies of these at sites as well. So you'll be able to stand in an area, look around and say, what site am I in? What zone am I in? And if you move between a zone, you record that point of transition. Take a picture on both sides, and then from the start of the transect to the transition point, 
we want to measure that distance so that we can understand how far or how large that band is. So that's the measurement between points. The transitions might not be clear cut. So it's all about kind of spending some time in the dunes, getting a feel for the different zones of the dune itself and what these look like. So all of those characteristics we spoke about to be able to mark down if you're transitioning between zones. And what you might find is that you transition from one zone back to another and back again. If it's wider than two meters, we count it as a transition and we need to be marking it down because that might be that a dune slack is only two meters anyway. So the reason we do that is because we want to find out what the transitions between the different zones are and map them over time. To understand is this changing between managed and unmanaged areas? And whether or not these areas are narrowing or widening, um, because this can indicate a loss of the dynamicness of the dunes. So the fixed grassland that we spoke about, so that's the fixed dune and the grassland area. If that's widening, it's kind of like that picture we saw of Kenvig, that was the grassland widening, that the area is becoming less dynamic because it's stable enough for it to widen. So we need to understand if that's happening. So before I carry on, has anyone got any questions about that? And I'll probably stop after every single monitoring method just to address any of those. But if you're typing, keep typing and I'll stop if they pop through. So the next one is a sand dune profile. So again, in the app, you can see here, you go through, you press plus and you get to dunes profile. And the dune profile is the shape of the dunes. So the aim here is to create a height profile of key areas of interest in a sand dune system. So again, this will only be at some sites. And this can help us understand if, again, if the dunes are changing, if the profile of the dunes are changing. And in some areas, it might be that we're just looking at the mobile dune system right on the strand line and about whether that's growing, how dynamic it is, um, or in some places, if it's actually eroding so that we've got an idea of what's happening in terms of the dune. So what this involves is walking along, again, a fixed transect and mapping the height profile of the dune. So this is my very crudely drawn profile in red that's just appeared at the bottom of the screen. And you can see if we were to take away the picture below, you'll end up with a profile of the dune. And this can be compared year on year um, or for over time as to how the dune has changed. So it's a fixed transect again, going from point A to point B and are best done in pairs. You're gonna to navigate to the start of the transect following the compass bearing. And then once you've found that, you'll start to navigate in that direction. And this survey involves using a clinometer and ranging poles. So again, this kit will be at sites that are using this type of monitoring. Um, and every site will have one of these if they are doing this type of monitoring. So at the very start, we're gonna use this picture at the bottom as a kind of tracking as I talk. So imagine this is the start. You've navigated to your GPS point. We're heading due north for simplicity. This is your transect and this is point one. So you record starting your point. If you're using the paper forms, you need to record that as a GPS point. But if you're doing the app, as soon as you hit start, it will record it automatically. Take a picture in both directions. Person number one is going to stand with one of the ranging poles and a clinometer, which is used to, uh, to assess the angle between two different points. And person two is going to walk along 50 meters. So this is our 50 meter X, or until there is a marked change in the slope of the dune. If you imagine this first bit, there hasn't been a marked change. So they've walked 
50 meters, no marks change. They'll record it and they'll take a picture in each direction. So what this would mean is they would put their pole down. So actually we'll use this one as a better example. So here's person one and here's person two. Person two has put their pole down. They're gonna record the GPS location and they're gonna take a picture each side of the transect. Now person one who stood here is gonna use the clinometer which measures angles. So it's kind of a big round thing. I would have one, but it hasn't been delivered yet. <laughs> Big round thing, um, and they're going to look and measure the slope from the pole here to the top of the pole here. They're going to record that. And then you need to record the distance between point one and point two. And that'll give us an idea to start building up this profile. So now, person two, so again, this was person one with the clinometer. This is person two. So person two stays where they are. And person one walks to person two, hands them the kilometer, hard word to say. And then they continue for the next 50 meters or until there is a marked change in the dune. So you can see here, there's this big slope. They pop down their pole. Now, person two use the kilometer to measure the angle between the two poles and record it and keep doing it until you get to the end of the transect. Now, like I said, understanding the height profile of a dune and what the system looks like can help us to understand if there's any changes happening over time. If the height profile is very stable, which we would imagine it to be in certain areas like the fixed dune, then it means that the area is not very dynamic. But if it's very stable in the mobile dunes, that also means they're not very dynamic, but it has implications for how we might change how we're managing that zone. So again, any questions, keep popping them in the chat for me and I'll stop and address them as we go, okay? So our third survey type is a quadrat. So square quadrat, that you're going to measure, that's well, bigger than this, but it's a square quadrat that you're going to measure what percentage cover we've got of different vegetation types. So we've got three, four things that we can do in our quadrats. The aim is to deepen our understanding, again, of how dynamic the dunes are, but also to be able to measure dune health. So this quadrat type, which is bare sand versus cover, is recording the percentage cover of bare sand versus the height and the cover of broad vegetation types. So these points are all fixed. So it's a fixed point quadrat on our dune sites. I should mention, if you're ever at a dune site that isn't a dynamic dune site, a dune site that isn't dynamic dunescapes, you may find that you can't do this kind of thing. And it's just because that site hasn't been set up as a site to do monitoring. So things have to be set up in the background before you can do monitoring sites. So at the moment, the monitoring exists at the 12 sites we mentioned for dynamic genescapes, as well as at Kenvig, and possibly some more as we move later, but also there's a suite of sites in England as well where this monitoring exists. So yeah, fixed point, navigate to it. And then once you get there, so you've navigated to your fixed point, you're gonna put a flag and that's your first corner of your quadrat. You're then gonna figure out which way is due north and start setting out your quadrat. So due north for two meters for point two, and this will be your next corner. And then turn to east, point three, corner, four down to south. And then what you're getting is a nice square, hopefully, <laughs> quadrat. <clears throat> And in that quadrat, you're then going to stand and look over the top and you're measuring percentage cover of those broad groups. And these broad groups are all characterized again in the app and in the handbook. So we're looking at bare ground or sand. And that's the one we're really looking for is to understand cover versus sand, because if we're expecting an area to be dynamic, we're expecting there to be bare sand present. Mosses and lichens grouped together. Grass. Herbs. Let me just move that. 
scrubs and try again shrubs and scrubs so just to give you some definitions there so yeah fairground and sand that one's really really clear mosses and lichens if you're unsure if it's a moss and a lichen again they're in the species guide but over time we are running id days we're running id courses so if that's something that's interesting you please do let me know Grasses, so that can include grasses, sedges and rushes, it's all things that kind of look a bit grassy, got quite long stems, they might have those seed heads that you see. Herbs, so that's a bit um, maybe not as obvious, but these are plants that are not, yes, PCID sessions. Uh, so yeah, these are all other plants that are not trees or shrubs, so it can include things like bramble, bracken or other ferns. Shrubs are more like bushes, so heather, gorse, bilberry, and scrub includes things like trees and young plants of trees or larger scrub. So what you want to do is stand there looking down on your quadrat, and then you're going to kind of start to get a picture of what the percentage cover of all of these different features are. The best way to do this is if you look at your two meter by two meter and you'll have used a tape measure to measure it out so you can leave that there or use it as a tool in your head begin to bunch things together so if you're looking and you're looking and thinking oh there's about 50 percent sand cover bare sand if you can bunch it and it feels half of the quadrat it's 50 percent and we've got some useful numbers here so 20 by 20 would be one percent cover because it's a two meter by two meter quadrat a 50 centimeter so now we're about this big uh, each way would be a 6.25 percent and a one by one meter so a whole corner would be 25 percent cover or the one by two meter would be 50 percent cover so by trying to imagine it all blocked up into one cluster it should make it a bit easier to estimate your percentage cover and if you're doing this with other people which it's best to do you can stand there and look at the percentage cover and then all discuss what you think it is, why justify it, and then come up with the average between yourselves. You may find that your total will exceed 100%. So, and that will be because you've got mosses that are sitting on top of brambles that are sitting on top of something else, but it shouldn't be less than or something's gone wrong. So you, should, you can get more than 100, but your ground cover should never be less than 100%, otherwise there is a black hole. <laughs> So just to bring this back to what we then use this data for is to understand the percentage cover of broad vegetation types in the different zones and whether this is changing and it's what we expect. We can look at it's changing over time. And if there's less bare sand, again, we're seeing that it's a less dynamic habitat. So I mentioned measuring the height of vegetation. So this one, these are now, for the next couple, are all based off of that quadrat. So they're all part of the quadrat you've set up, got to the site, you've gone and found your quadrat, you've staked it out, and now you're going to stand there for a little while, probably an hour, probably a little bit longer, and you're going to look at what's in that quadrat. So once you've got your broad habitat and your broad vegetation types, we're going to measure the height of vegetation. What you're going to do is in the quadrat, Going to take five measurements so each corner and smack bang in the middle so that'll give us five and what you're going to do is you get your tape measure and you'll measure roughly what the height is average height of the plant within 20 centimeters of the point you're measuring if you're using the paper version note these all down work out the average but if you're using the app, you just pop them all in, pop all five, and then that will calculate an automatic average for that quadrat. So that just gives us an extra bit of data so we can understand what the vegetation height is and how it might be changing at different points in the gene system. So that we can compare between gene systems. And then a lot of short vegetation can suggest that there's been, again, a loss of dynamicness, you're sensing a theme but also an increase in nutrient enrichment or a lack of grazing because those species are being enabled or allowed to grow larger. 
Um, and if we're expecting that there should be grazing happening there, then we need to look into why it's not. Or if it's indicating there's been nutrient enrichment and you're getting these fast growing species, they'll be out competing other species in reducing biodiversity. Again, sticking in the same quadrat. This time, what we're wanting to do is go that little bit deeper. So this is now starting to dive in what plants are actually present. And what you might find on different sites is that site managers are also really interested in your reporting sightings of other specific plants. And that's the kind of information you can get from the sites themselves. So that might be they want you to report if you see the Japanese rose, which is the invasive species, or Japanese knotweed, because that's something we need to control because we don't want to spread. So this one's going to be looking at recording the cover of indicator species. So all of the indicator species, we mentioned sea holly earlier. So sea holly is at the top and each different part of the dune has about 10 indicator species for dune health and 10 indicator species for nitrogen content of the soil. So the dune house species are species that we expect to be in those areas we're expecting to see and they're an indicator of if it's the mobile dune they're indicators of a mobile dune and if it's a fixed dune it's an indicator of the kind of conditions we expect there so if we started finding a species that's a fixed dune indicator species in the mobile dune again that's something we want to be aware of because it means that the type of plants present has shifted and that might mean that something else is going on in terms of the health of the dune. And then you can also see underneath the birds that trefoil is a dune slack um, and fixed dune positive indicator species. And we want to know what the distribution and cover of these species are, how it's changing over time. And if it is shifting because these specific species have been chosen because they indicate high nitrogen loading or lack of health, we can already get an indication of something going on. So roses are negative indicators and the harebell is a nitrogen sensitive species. So if we get harebells, we can kind of understand what nitrogen levels are in the soil without then having to also do more work to measure those nitrogen levels. So these species are really great to monitor because they give us a good overview of what's going on in the habitat without then having to actually do more monitoring work. And we can kind of cover a lot of bases by monitoring indicator species rather than doing other monitoring as well. So yeah, these ones we'll be looking at in terms of nutrient enrichment and how the site is being affected as a result of nutrient enrichment, if it is. So how do we do that? So again, two by two meter quadrat, we're sticking there. Nothing's changed about that one. You stand over and this time you're going to need in the app there's the species guide so you'll need to know what habitat you're in so here we're in the fixed dune in this picture and we're looking out to the woodland at the back so i know we're in the fixed dune so i'm going to look in my guide and i'm going to get to fixed dune and then i'm going to look at my quadrat and begin to try to identify what's in the quadrat so you might if there's a there will be id books again with site managers survey leaders, borrow a site uh, a handbook so that you can go through and identify species, but have, then there'll be hard copies of the species guides as well. So you're looking over, you're looking at your percentage cover, you're trying to start to work out what species there are, work through it systematically, look at your list, have I got X, Y, and Z? Once you find, say, bird's foot trefoil, I found it, now I'm gonna record the cover, and that's the exact same as before, the only difference with this, because we're looking for specific species, if it's less than 1% cover, we record it as 0.5. And that's just to add it up and make it nice and clean for our data entry. So we're recording it's present, but it is quite low presence. And then you do the same again. So this would be for both June health species and nitrogen enrichment in the same quadrat. So there's lots of things you can do at that quadrat point. So you complete the two, submit the data. But yeah, this work does require some ID skills. Um, so this is why we are putting on ID sessions, but we've got so many um, experts that are at our sites. And also what we would like to see is that people can also discuss things between themselves once they start meeting others on 
this training or that are volunteering at sites that have got themselves these ID skills. So you start to learn what these species are. What our ID sessions really look at is how you use taxonomic keys, what things you look out for when you're IDing a species. Um, because the actual idea of a species, as some of you might be aware, is something that comes with time, getting familiar with the species and knowing X from Y. Um, and some, then one day you'll walk and go, that's that. And some days you'll walk and go, I still don't know what it is. So that's fine, because everyone's learning. And yeah, each area has about 10 to 20 indicator species. So that's why when you get to your habitat, you need to think, what habitat am I in? Otherwise you're gonna be looking at a list of 60 and some of them you would never see there or wouldn't be expecting to see there anyway. So yeah, it's look at what habitat you're in, find the species guide, and then start to go through what survey am I doing? Now, what indicator species am I looking for? Okay. So this one is how we measure water tables in the June environment. So the water table, as we mentioned, can fluctuate through the year. And that's why we want to measure it to understand the hydrology of the area. What we do to do this is sites have had something called dip wells installed. So they essentially look like a pipe. Um, and you can measure, because there are a lot of them are three meters in the ground, the water level throughout the year. And some points of the year, the water level will be above the dip well. This isn't at all of our sites, it's only at some of them. So again, it's in the handbook how we do this. But the aim is to monitor water table depth and dune slacks, the seasonal wetlands within the gene system by tracking the water table depth over the year. The reason we want to do this is because, so when I introduced dune slacks earlier, we spoke about how a dune slack is a very particular part of the dune um, and the water table will influence the type of dune slack vegetation that's present and the health of the vegetation. So if we learn that a dune slack is starting to dry out, that might be because we're finding that it's been dominated by woody species that are absorbing more water and therefore drying the dune slack out. Or if we find that it's actually wetter, that might be that now we understand that the water table has risen for some reason. And these areas are key for the breeding of things like nasty toads and also many insects that use the damp sand. So if you're interested in this, and at the moment, the, the sites where we've got um, these dip wells present is Kenvig. Um, so I know the volunteers there do monitor the dip wells. And then we've also got them at Cromlin Burrows and some at Pembrey. So if you're interested in kind of contributing to the monitoring of dip wells, again, shout um, so that we can understand what kind of things people are interested in doing. And we can also, we can pick these up on our field days. So fixed points, they look like a pipe. So what you want to do is navigate to the survey station using a GPS and the app. And then they have a cap on top to stop things going in there. So you take the cap off. And this is why we need to do this one particularly, um, usually with a site manager or at least getting access, because some of the caps will have a key, some of the caps will have, they'll need to be removed in a certain way. And then using a measuring device, you measure where the water level is in the tube. So using my glass, basically you drop it in. And if it's a monitor, once it hits the water, it'll start to squeal. And then what you do is you grab from the surface level, the cable of the monitor, pull the monitor back out, which is my finger in this case, <laughs> and you measure how long or how deep the monitor went before it started to make the noise that said you'd hit the water level. And that'll fluctuate over time. And if the water level is above the dip well, we try and measure how far above the dip well and record that as well. And then at the end, you take a photograph because that can be used, especially if it's above, to say this is why we made that recording. So yeah, so this is helping us to understand changes over time, whether June slacks are drying out, whether they're becoming wetter, but also it's an indicator. So June slacks are where we find key species like the fen orchid, um, which if you do head down to places like Kenvig, you might be lucky to find some Ken, or, Ken orchids, fen orchids, which we don't have many of, um, particularly there's only very particular sites where this is found now. 
And this will give indication of a whole range of things from nutrients in the water to um, climate change and other impacts that's happening in the surrounding area. So if the water table is changing or the areas are drying out, it's indicating something on the larger scale is happening. So the one thing we do have at every single site is fixed point photography. And this is the one that I mentioned right at the start, using again the Kenvig example from the 40s to, to 2013, is that you can use fixed point photography to track changes. And they're really powerful tools to be able to monitor how changes happened at a site over a given period of time. So the aim is to track that change using a photographic record. And these can be compared year on year across decades. And it's used across all of our sites through the Dunescape app. But again, if you're doing it on paper, you just need to record the picture, then these need to get uploaded. So looking at the app, this is what it looks like once you click through to surveys. So imagine we're back on the home screen, you click to surveys, and now you're being presented with a whole range of lovely activities. So this is fixed point photography, the quadrats, which we've covered. So all of that, the four different survey types that we mentioned in quadrat recording would go here. The June profile, which is using the colonometer and the ranging poles. The water table, which is dip wells. The zonation mapping, which is the transition between zones. We haven't got to this one yet. <laughs> so fixed point photography. At fixed points, usually indicated by a wooden post, yet to be installed. So they will be gradually getting installed at all of our sites. You're going to find the post again, GPS points in the app, so you navigate to it, find the post, and then there will be a reference photo in the app. So looking at the app, it will give you a reference photo, a reference image, and a direction that image was taken. So this is why we say GPS app, because actually for a lot of this navigation, your phone will do it brilliantly. So using that reference photo, you line up your camera and you take a picture, and then you just upload it. And simple as that, we really do want the photos to line up with the example photo so that we can compare comparisons over the years. So if the photo is going that way, don't turn around and take it that way, unless there's also a photo going that way, which you'll find at most of our stations. Um, but just make sure you get the photos the right way around. Otherwise, someone years from now will be comparing going, oh, the sea disappeared in that one. <laughs> so yeah, they must line up. And this is an example of why. So again, Studden Bay in the 1930s, you can see that there was a lot of bare open sand, there would have been a lot of dynamicness of the dunes, but then over the years it's become vegetated, it's become stabilised. So we begin to make assessments of how the morphology, the form, the shape, the structure has changed over time. And this may lead to a change or inform site management decisions in the years to come. So the last one is disturbance. And as we mentioned, disturbance comes at different levels. Some level of disturbance can be great, some can be less desirable. So the disturbance monitoring isn't fixed point. It's very much if you're out and about on site and you see disturbance, you can record the signs of it. This might also be damage or other aspects or points of interest around the site. So we do this by recording disturbance caused by animals or humans under disturbance. So again, plus sign, and it was that one in the bottom right, you just hit record, and then you can record what it is and what type of disturbance and submit a photo as well. So it might be you're recording the presence of ponies and they've been walking through a site churning the land up. There's been people walking through the site and therefore, or it could be something more drastic such as fly tipping. Um, we might even be asking people at times of the year to record rabbit presence so we can try to understand the rabbit population better. So what this will allow us to do is see how disturbance may be changing over time or how it can change the site over time and can give an indication of patterns of disturbance. So is there particular areas where we're seeing a lot of disturbance, for example, litter, and that can guide site management in the future if we need to put controls in place for that. So that was all of our different monitoring strategies and monitoring methods that we're using and how you can get involved to help monitor these sites. So just in front of you there, and again, links are going to get sent out. 
we have a range of YouTube videos. The only one that's not on there at the moment is the June profile, which will be coming up later this year. Um, so you can go through, there's a whole playlist of how to, and they're only about four minutes long, so you could watch all of them in less than an hour, how to do the vegetation quadrat surveys. And then there's also a playlist of how to use the app to enter the data. On our website as well, there is videos all the way from talking about juniper and juniper and dunes, uh, all the way to our pause for thought campaigns. There's a whole range of stuff there that you can learn about. So I'm going to talk about field dates in a second, but I'm just going to run to go and get a drink. So if any of you got any questions, feel free to unmute um, or write them down in the chat and I'll be back in just a moment. Okay, how are you doing? So, no questions as of yet, that's fine. Um, it's a lot to absorb. So yeah, this recording will be circulated. And like I said, there'll be loads of resources that I'll send over as well that might be of interest. So, in terms of field dates, there's gonna be a number of training days. Um, some of these might change slightly, but I will, if you're happy to, um, for me to record your emails, and I will share these as and when they get organized. But also, if you don't already, the next slide will have our social media. So do follow us on social media. Um, and I post all of the events up there. And we have an events page you can look at as well. So obviously, you're all based in South Wales. So we have got um, a training day coming up in Pembrey that's maybe a little bit further from the three of you. But there is a training day at Crumlin Burrows on the 15th of June and a full training day on the 17th of June at uh, Kenvig. So the distinction I made there, Crumlin Burrows will be a tour of the site and going through survey techniques. So there won't be a refresh of what we've done today. Kenvig is gonna be slightly different in that at Kenvig, in the morning, there will be this presentation at first thing. And then after that, tour of the site and the training. So you can come to either. And if you've already done this and you want to come to Kenvig, just come a little bit later. All of those details will be shared once the events are live. So that's kind of what I'm doing in the next kind of couple of weeks is just getting those up onto the website. Again, it will be an Eventbrite link for people to sign up to. And we'll probably max them out at 10 people per place. Um, so yeah, just let me know if that's of interest to you. Is everyone happy for me to record your emails down um, and your details so that I can get in contact you, with you in the future? Okay. Oh, <laughs> or you're like, no. <laughs> Bit too excited with the enter button there. <laughs> that was one of those moments I was like, Sarah, I totally respect your boundary setting there. <laughs> um, so yeah, so in terms of registering interest, again, I will well, thanks, Rich. Um, I'll send all the details around through Eventbrite anyway, so these will come through to you. Um, just with your emails, I can then follow up with things. I have have stuff from Eventbrite, but with being able to use your emails, obviously it's GDPR, we have to ask. Um, I can send you other resources as well as we crack on. Um, so you can join various events. Um, it's not just all about training, guided walks as well, and other things as well, so art workshops, for example. Um, and getting involved on World Sand Dune Day. So that's the 25th of June. And if you go to the events, everything will be posted there. It will be all over our social media. Trust me, you will not be able to miss World Sand Dune Day. 
And then you can also follow us on our social media. Um, so I will leave that up while I just talk about a few other things that we've got going on. Um, so in terms of Dynamic Genescapes this year, as I said, we're coming into the last year of the project. So the project ends March 2023. Between now and then, we're going to have lots of exciting kind of taster events almost. So some ID training, um, some other kind of it could be ID on plants, it could be ID on bugs, bees, butterflies. So a various range of training happening at different sites and surveys that we'd be thrilled if you would like to join. Um, Rich, can I just, <laughs> thanks Larry. Um, Rich, can I just ask, are you, you're at Swansea, right? So are you based, you don't need to give specifics, are you based towards Kenwig or are you actually based around Swansea? Hi, Hannah. Um, I'm actually sort of Cowbridge way. Bridget, okay, Cowbridge way. Yeah. cool. I'm so, willing yeah. to travel, but yeah, Ken Fig would be ideal for me. Okay, great. Just so you, I can get an idea. You don't do idea. anything on Merthyr Mawr, no? No, we don't. Not on Merthyr Mawr. So Merthyr Mawr is a Sands of Life site. So we are working with Sands of Life to look at what, how we can work together to create opportunities like that. But at the moment, most of what we do, so Ken Fig is through partnership and, and then is our other Dunescape sites. Um, so I'm not saying no, because there might be stuff in the future. But at the moment, most of what I help support is delivered at Ken Fig. That's brilliant. Yeah, thanks very much. Well, um, so yeah, so there's all things happening through the year. So please do follow on social media and I will send around and keep you updated um, as well via email. And then just the other thing to mention there is that if um, you or anyone you know are aged 18 to 30, we have a young person's bursary um, that has been live since Spoiled Earth Day, so it came back live. And that's £500 for student projects or just young person's projects. They do not need to be a student working on a dune system. So previously, this has been focused around dynamic dunescapes locations. But if people are working on Kenvig, for example, or Merthyr Mau and want to do a research project, then they can come and do a research or a media project just so they can develop their skills, be it for field work or if there's some training they want to get, they want funding for training. Um, or they want funding for equipment, for travel, we'd love to support it. So that's all on our website, um, but you can email me for more details about that as well. Um, and yeah, each of those bursaries is £500. The first deadline for application is the 6th of June, but it's a rolling deadline. So the next one will be six weeks later, so on and so forth, until October. Um, so yeah, so that's about everything. Hopefully you've all noted these details down, but again, they'll be in an email that I send as a follow-up. I'm going to stop the share and thank you so much so yeah has anyone got any questions I will send around a um questionnaire so I would be really thrilled if you'd be happy to respond to that and just give us some feedback um and that can just help improve and reflect anything that you thought was really great or anything you think needs improving as well